Getting dappy. Oh, George, another surprise. Am I getting a one pound box or a two pound box? I love dappy. That's my favorite candy. Stop it, you're getting nuts. Oh, well, George, if it's just the same to you, could I have dappy without nuts? You knew he was a bad doctor? Yeah, all his patients were sick. <laughs> <laughs> you're very observing. Oh, here's a good one. Have you got a pencil? There's a pencil on the back table. All right. He had a beautiful blonde nurse, and even she was sick. She was sick, yeah, too? Yeah, she kept begging him to take out her appendix. The nurse wanted her appendix taken out? Yeah, every time she went into his private office, I could hear her saying, Now, doctor, please cut it out. <laughs> you gotta light the cigar. I can't, I can't talk unless I smoke seeing me without a cigar is like seeing Mrs. Miller on the middle page of Playboy. <laughs> and at my age, that's exciting. I stand up, and I sit down, and I dance a little bit. I don't kick the back of my head, and I don't do splits anymore, you know. Be 95 and get out of bed. And have something to do and, and love what you're doing is terribly important. George Burns, a century of laughter. Not only is George a very good personal friend of mine, but he's a tremendous friend to everyone in our whole organization. It took a lot of years to set up this moment, which is a lifetime contract culminating in a celebration of George's 100th birthday at Caesar's Palace. And that's what we're here to celebrate today and here to sign this contract. Uh, here's a song. Here's a song I sang with the, with the, with the Pee Wee Quartet. <laughs> Red Rose Rag. Down in the garden where the red roses grow. Oh my, I want... George Burns. Can you ever remember a time without him? Well, probably not, unless you're well over 100 years old. That's because for most of the 20th century, George Burns has been a vital and popular fixture of modern show business. With wit and charm, Burns has triumphed in each new facet of entertainment that he encountered on his fabulous journey. From vaudeville to movies, from radio to television, best-selling author, sold-out nightclub and concert entertainer, and recording star. And the two things Burns has said he is most proud of? Beloved husband and partner of Gracie Allen, and dear friend to almost every show business great of our time. George Burns was born Nathan Birnbaum on January 20th, 1896, in New York's Lower East Side. He was the ninth of 12 children born to Lewis and Hadassah Birnbaum. Lewis worked in the garment industry and died when Nathan was just seven years old. It was about this time that Nathan acquired his new surname of Burns. The family lived near the Burns brothers' coal yard, and young Nathan and his friends would stuff coal in their clothing to take home. Local residents, seeing the kids pass with their clothes filled with coal, would shout, There goes the Burns brothers! To complete his new name, Nathan took his older brother Izzy's nickname of George. George's earliest exposure to show business may have come by following the organ grinders who plied the streets of the city. And soon after, George would offer competition when he and his friends began performing on the streets as the Pee Wee Quartet. I've been singing all my life. I started when I was eight years old. I sang with three kids, the Pee Wee Quartet. There was me, Mortsy, and Heshy Weinberger. <laughs> Mortsy was seven and Heshy was six. And then there was one kid, Toda Mitchell. He was five years old. He sang bass. <laughs> And he handled the business for the act. But well, we let him do that because it worked out so well for us. You see, when Toda divided up the coins that the people threw at us, being a baby, he kept the big ones, the nickels and the pennies, and gave us the dime. This, this was great until one day somebody threw us a quarter. We had to explain the facts of life to him. When Toda was six, his mother made him quit show business and go to school. Then we had to change the name of our act. And uh, there was a store on the east side called Applebaum Suits for Boys. <laughs> we went in to see Mr. Applebaum. We told him that if he'd give us a suit for free, he 
Each one of us, we we would we we would call ourselves the Applebaum Trio. <laughs> Applebaum says, "Let me hear you boys sing." He heard us, and after he heard us, he said, um, "I'll give you each a suit if you don't use my name." <laughs> and 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 the funny the funny thing is, I could I I needed that suit. I came from a very big family. There were there were twelve of us children, uh, seven sisters and five brothers, and we were very close. We had to be. We lived in three rooms. <laughs> we weren't the poorest people on the block. There were people that were poorer, but they hadn't come to America yet. As a young man, Burns was hooked on show business. Although he didn't have a clear career goal in mind, he knew he had to perform. He began working under various names and with partners that even included a seal named Flipper. Later, while performing a dancing act with Hannah Siegel, the team was offered a 36-week road tour. The girl's father wouldn't allow her to go unless the couple were married. Burns married Hannah, and 36 weeks later, they were divorced, which also put George back as a single act. George now embarked on a series of ill-fated acts under various names. Burns would later say, After playing a theater, I had to change my name because the booker would never give me another job if he knew who I was. For the next 75 years, George would delight audiences with stories of his early experiences in show business. When I was 17, I'd already been in show business for eight years. In fact, by then I was making my third comeback. I changed my name every week I had to. I couldn't get a job with the same name twice. I remember sitting in an agent's office and he came out and he said, where could I find Harry Harris? I said, I'm Harry Harris. I thought I was. <laughs> he gave me a contract to play the Myrtle Theater in Brooklyn three days for $15. The contract said, Harry Harris thrills on wheels. It was a bicycle act. I was never on a bicycle in my life, but I figured for $15, I couldn't be bad. So I rented a bicycle, went out to the Myrtle Theater, got out on the stage with the bicycle and stood there and held it while I did my act. <laughs> I sang my opening song, I'll be coming back to Eliza when I'm finished with the Kaiser. <laughs> then I did my big ballad, Tiger Girl. And then in the middle of my next number, while I was yodeling, I happened to look off stage and the manager was doing this. I looked down into the pit and the musicians were doing that. And I looked at the audience and they were doing that. You know, I never made it to the dressing room. <laughs> The manager came out on the stage and told me I was canceled. What really hurt was that the audience gave him a round of applause. <laughs> and the musicians gave him a standing ovation. When I was 21, I ran out of names. Not only ran out of names, I ran out of food, I ran out of clothes, I even ran out of partners. Do you know that I wound up doing an act with a chicken? It was a novelty act. This chicken used to dance on one leg. We called the act Jack Davis and Chick Fowler. <laughs> My name was Chick Fowler. <laughs> we opened at the Folly Theater in Brooklyn. The chicken was a riot, and I laid an egg. <laughs> then the chicken left me and went to work with Willie Delight. And Willie used to like to nip a little bit. But like most drinkers, he, he hated to drink alone. And before you know it, the chicken was getting smashed. <laughs> now, when you're smashed, it's hard enough to dance on two legs, but I'm one leg. And in no time at all, the act couldn't get a job. I ran into Willie Delight. I says, I hear things are bad. He says, awful. He says, I was so hungry last night, I pretty near ate my partner. <laughs> I said, Willie, you wouldn't do a thing like that. He says, no, but I must admit that I ate the leg she wasn't using. <laughs> By 1922, George still hadn't found a sufficient partner or a successful act, but it didn't stop him from auditioning for the top producers of the day. I remember that Zickfield auditioned for, for, for chorus girls, and he threw me out, but I tried. <laughs> Another time, Gus Edwards was putting on an act in Vaudeville called the Shoeshine Boys. I was a little kid then. I walked in with my box, started the shiny shoes, and I sang, Shine, shine, five cents a shine. My name is Teddy, and I'm always ready. My blacking is new and my brushing is fine, so that's, 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 when, that's the power I got. Not only didn't get the job, but he took my polish away, too. 
<laughs> yeah, but I, I never let disappointments get me down. I always kept smiling. Got to be such a habit, I even smiled in my sleep, and I was sharing a room then with another out-of-work actor who was going around with a girl he, he was insanely jealous of. Woke up one night and saw me smiling and thought I was dreaming of her and punched me in the nose. <laughs> Things were real rough then. But a little voice, I was ready to quit, and a little voice always kept saying, inside of me, a little voice would say, all you need is a chance and you'll, you'll be great. And I finally got that chance. I, I played the, the Flatbush Theater in Brooklyn and, and the audience booed me off the stage. As I walked off, the little voice inside of me said, Okay, so I'm a liar. Later in 1922, while working in New Jersey, George was about to lose yet another partner, and he would meet the person who would change his life forever, Gracie Allen. Grace Ethel Cecile Rosalie Allen was born on July 26, 1906 in San Francisco. Her father was a song and dance man who also ran a dance school from the family's home. Gracie made her stage debut at age three. At 14, she joined her sisters in an Irish dancing act known as the Allen Sisters. As a teenager, Gracie and two of her sisters were part of an act starring Larry Riley. When the act was booked into Hoboken, only Riley's name appeared on the theater's marquee. Gracie quit the act, traveled across the river to New York, and enrolled in secretarial school. But shortly after, a friend persuaded Gracie to go back to New Jersey and meet a young performer who was looking for a new partner. The man, of course, was George Burns. And my name then was Smiling Frankie Davis. <laughs> in smart songs and syncopated pattern. My opening number was... The birds are sweetly singing and perfume flowers are bringing and the wind is worn as it's passing by. <laughs> by. I love to sing. And after my opening song, I looked out in the audience and I spotted Gracie sitting in the tenth row. This wasn't hard to do. She was the only one left. <laughs> <clears throat> so I leaned over the footlights and I thanked her for staying and she said, now you can do something for me. Help me with my dress. It's caught in the seat. <laughs> I did, and that night we had our first date, and I was short of money, and I went out to see the manager, and I walked into his office, and I says, How do you do? I'm smiling Frankie Davis. How did you like my act? And he punched me right in the mouth. <laughs> From then on, I was known as plain Frankie Davis. <laughs> The new team's first break came in 1925 when they were booked for a 16-week run on the Orpheum circuit. By 1926, Burns and Allen was an established act and were earning big bucks playing the Keith's theater chain. On January 7, 1926, Gracie Allen, just 19 years old, and George Burns, almost 30, were married by a justice of the peace. I borrowed two dollars from Gracie to pay for the marriage license. It's true. He borrowed five. <laughs> Imagine the predicament I was in. Didn't have two dollars for the marriage license. I had to borrow two dollars from Gracie. He borrowed five. That's I was so embarrassed, five. I told the fellow in front of me that I left dollars. my suit. My, I left my money in my other suit. Five. My other suit. In fact, I borrowed five. the suit I had. Five. I never... <laughs> you know, come to think of it, I think I borrowed five dollars from Gracie. Five, got it. He still owes me three dollars change. I wonder if I ever paid her back. In early 1927, the team really hit the big time when they played the Palace Theater in New York. In 1929, while playing in New York, Burns and Allen were asked to substitute for Fred Allen in a Warner Brothers Vitaphone short. With the arrival of sound, vaudeville stars with their brief and well-rehearsed routines had become an attractive property to the film studios. After finishing the film, the couple left for England where they were booked into various night spots. They were an immediate hit, and the BBC signed Burns and Allen for a 26-week radio engagement. For the first time, millions of people could hear the comedy routines that the team had polished to a luster, traveling the American vaudeville circuit. Well, Gracie, which one of your brilliant relatives will we talk about tonight? Brilliant relatives? Yeah. Oh, George, you're making it difficult for me. I know I am. Well, there's so many of them, it's 
got to be hard to choose. Yeah, just, just, just a family of geniuses. I guess there's no such thing as, uh, as, uh, as a normal Alan. Oh, well, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, uh, me too. Well, the one we're most proud of was Mozart Alan, the famous conductor and composer. Mozart Alan? Is he living yet? Not yet. You're right. Is he living yet? Not yet. I heard right. Uh, what, uh, what kind of music did he write? Well, the first thing he wrote was his Symphony 97. That's the first thing? Yes. Well, he figured he'd have a better chance if people didn't think he was just... Just the beginner, yes. Yeah, sure. After all those years and all those partners, George had finally figured out the secret to success. And the secret's name was Gracie. I'm George Burns, Gracie Allen's husband. <laughs> For the benefit of those who've never seen me before, I'm what is known in show business as a straight man. You know what a straight man is? I'll tell you. After the comedian gets through with a joke, I look at the comedian and then I look at the audience like this. That is known as a pause. <laughs> If I must say so myself, I'm famous for my pauses. <laughs> when I'm really rolling, this is one of my ad libs. <laughs> and there's another thing a straight man must know. He must repeat everything the comedian says. For instance, if Gracie should say, a funny thing happened on the streetcar today. I say, a funny thing happened on the streetcar today? Naturally, her answer gets a scream. And than I do one of my famous pauses. Uh, you know, I've been a straight man so long that from force of habit, I, uh, I repeat everything. I went out fishing with a fellow once and he fell overboard and he hollered, help, help, help. And I said, help, help, help. <laughs> While I was waiting for him to get his laugh, he drowned. <laughs> See, you see, to be a straight man, you, you have to have a talent. You have to develop this talent. Then you got to marry her like I did. <laughs> Upon returning to the United States, Paramount Pictures signed the team to appear in a series of comedy film shorts. In all, Burns and Allen appeared in 12 one-reelers for the studio. But George and Gracie had one more obstacle to overcome. Although the duo had been a hit on radio in England, Back home, they were turned down for an NBC radio show. The network's reason was that the public wouldn't accept Gracie's squeaky voice. So the team returned to the vaudeville circuit. In 1930, while playing the Palace Theater, Eddie Cantor invited Gracie to appear on his radio program without George. Burns not only allowed Gracie to appear, he even wrote a routine which Cantor performed with Gracie. Just one week later, Rudy Valley, who was credited with discovering such stars as Milton Berle and Edgar Bergen, invited Burns and Allen on his popular radio show. The couple were a smash, and in February 1932, the team became regulars on the CBS radio's The Robert Burns Panatella Program, which also starred the Guy Lombardo Orchestra. The team created a national sensation with a continuing routine which centered around Gracie looking for her long-lost brother. In this picture, she's explaining to George that her brother looks like the missing jigsaw puzzle piece. In 1932, Burns and Allen travel to Hollywood to appear in their first feature film, Paramount's The Big Broadcast. In all, Burns and Allen would appear in three of the big broadcast films. To promote the first big broadcast movie, the couple also appeared in this 1932 short, Hollywood on Parade with Bing Crosby. Let's go. Hi. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. Let's go. Looking good. Now, I'm taking a death you come out to be in that big picture. You mean a big broadcast? Yeah, it's my plug. Yeah, it's out of there. You know, George, I've wanted to tell you for a long time. I've seen you on the screen, heard you over the air, and uh, worked with you in the theater. I really think that you have one of the finest acts in show business. Oh, thanks very much. I mean that sincerely. Thanks. I certainly wish I could say something nice about you. Well, you could if you were as big a liar as I am. I'll see you later, Bing. Just I... a minute. I was wondering, George, you know the young lady in your act, uh, Miss Allen? Uh, Gracie. Yeah, sure. She's delightful. You like her? I think she's a charming girl. I, I, I like her myself. She's a beautiful girl, too. I think so. I was wondering if uh, you could fix it up for me to meet Miss Allen. Now, do you like our act, or do you like Miss Allen? 
Well, I likes the act and I likes Miss Allen. Sort of likes everything. Yeah, with me it's likes. I see. Well, I'll have you meet Miss Allen. Uh, Gracie, uh, this is Gracie Allen, and I... I, I oh, will... Martha Downey. No, no, Rudy Valley. Gracie, that's Bing Crosby. Oh, well, now you all got to change your name. Nobody will know well, you. No, glad to see you. Thank you. Having a nice time in California. Oh, yes. Getting around a lot, a lot of spots? Oh, no, I'm not getting around very much. That's so. Well, I was wondering, uh, you ever wonder? Well, sure, I wandered through the field picking poppies a lot no, no, of no, times. No, no I, I mean, I was wondering if uh, you'd like to go out with me. Well, why should you be an exception? Well, Gracie, I was wondering if you'd like to go out. Oh, I would, Dave. I'd you, love it. You really would? Yes. Would you like to go out tonight? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't make it tonight. I have an engagement. Who with? My husband. You're married? Oh, yes. Didn't you know? No. Oh, yes. Who to? To Mr. Burns. Oh, aren't you silly? Well, everybody in town knows I'm married, Dave. Isn't that funny? <laughs> well, I did the best I could, Bing. I'll be the same. Wee wee. Bye now. The following year, Burns and Allen were back in another Paramount film, International House. Miss Allen. Yes? Come here. Uh, there's a man outside with a rash. You, oh, you... rash? Is it this year's model with freewheeling and floating power, or is it last year? Yes, year's... yes. It's a coupe. You know what a coupe is. Oh, sure. My father's got one, only he parts his in the middle. <laughs> Nineteen thirty-three was proving to be a banner year for Burns and Allen. They were enjoying success in films and on the radio, where CBS gave the couple their own program, and they finished the year with another film for Paramount, College Humor. Nineteen thirty-four saw more films, including Six of a Kind, Many Happy Returns, and We're Not Dressing. Stop it! Stop it! You're getting daffy. Oh, George, another surprise. Am I getting a one-pound box or a two-pound box? I love Daffy. That's my favorite candy. Stop it. You're getting nuts. Oh, well, George, if it's just the same to you, could I have Daffy without nuts? There was no question that by 1934, Burns and Allen had become major stars, and they were given the star treatment when they attended the Broadway premiere of Billy Rose's production of Jumbo at the Hippodrome Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, George Burns and Gracie Allen... Gracie, say hello to everybody. Hello, hello everybody. That's very good. Well, what do I say now? Well, Jumbo was opening. Say something. Uh, about Jumbo? Uh, Jumbo, yeah, Jumbo. Well, all I can say about Jumbo is yes. uh, if it stays open as long as it stayed closed, well, it'll be another ABC Irish oh, Rose. That's good. Well, say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. In 1935, Burns and Allen appeared in Here Comes Cookie and Love in Bloom with Jack Benny. The Burns and Benny friendship is legendary, dating back to their earliest days in show business. The two men and their wives were all lifelong best friends. Benny and Burns exchanged appearances on each other's shows many times. Their ongoing routine about George's singing and Jack's violin never failed to delight the audience. Your show can't miss. Now look, look at the talent you've got. You got Grable, Bergen, Bobby Darren, uh, Hermes Pan Dancers, Jeff Alexander's music, and of course, me. <laughs> Jack, you um, you left somebody out. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Your director, Greg Garrison. <laughs> well, what show am I on? I know I'm working. I'm wearing makeup. <laughs> George, look at I was getting around to you. After all, this is an hour show, isn't it? Well, see if you can squeeze me in before the closing credits. <laughs> Look, you've got the most important job. You don't realize you've got the most important job on this whole show. Oh? You're the host. The host. Well, good. Now, what does the host do? Are you kidding? What does... Look, when all of these great performers get up and do their wonderful numbers... Who's the fella who does this? I, uh, I do this, huh? What a talent. <laughs> You're right, Jack. I don't think there's anybody in show business who has a better pair of palms than I have. I got a surprise for you. I'm not only going to be the host, but I'm going to sing with Grable, with Bergen, with Darren, with the Hermes Pan Dancers with uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Alexander's orchestra. 
And when the show is over, I'm singing with our director, Greg Garrison. <laughs> George, you've got me wrong. See, I love your singing. I think you've got a style that's your own. You've got a great voice. You do? Sure. Look, I've never told you this. Oh? But after a golf game, when you take a shower at Hillcrest Country Club, I always take the shower next to yours. Just to hear me sing? I don't even turn on the water. <laughs> really, Jack? George, many a day I've come home to Mary dirty but happy. <laughs> you sure it's not to save money on towels? You're corny. <laughs> but look, George, I really love your singing. Well, Jack, uh, I've never told you this before. Now, this just goes for me. I don't care about anybody else. To me, you're one of the world's greatest violinists. You think so? Huh? Oh, yes. You're just as good as, 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 uh, as, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Yasha Heifetz? Yasha Heifetz. No. <laughs> well, Jack, you're just as good as, 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 uh, as, uh, Isaac Stern? Isaac Stern. Oh, George. I mean, <laughs> and, and, Jack, you're just as good as, 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 um, Rubenstein? Him, too. He's a pianist! <laughs> Burns and Allen's success on radio and in films brought more than financial rewards. It gave them stability. Gone were the days of traveling the vaudeville circuits from town to town. It was time for a home and a family. In 1936, the couple adopted their first child, Sandra. A year later, they moved to Beverly Hills and adopted their son, Ronnie. Also in 1936, Burns and Allen appeared in College Holiday. In 1937, Burns and Allen received co-star billing with Fred Astaire in RKO's Damsel in Distress. Not only did the team provide the film's laughs, they also danced with Astaire in the movie's Oscar-winning dance routine. Back on radio, the Burns and Allen show was more popular than ever. Gracie once said, George tells me we've been on the radio for nearly six years now, but whenever I turn the radio on in the house, I never get me. In 1938, Burns and Allen reunited with Bing Crosby for the Paramount release, College Swing. And in 1939, the team made their last picture together, Honolulu. Gracie made three films without George, The Gracie Allen Murder Case, Mr. and Mrs. North, and Two Girls and a Sailor. In all, the team had made 14 feature films, but according to Burns, Gracie never really felt comfortable making films or on radio. She once told a reporter, my hands are cold and clammy, my face is hot, and sometimes I really fumble my lines. But George loves it because the audience loves it. Uh, let's go down to the bar and have a drink. Say, Pop, you're a fast worker. Well, I have to work fast. I'm getting old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't get it. What happened? A man just fainted. Oh, a man just fainted. A man just fainted. Get up. In 1940, Burns and Allen pulled off another great radio stunt when Gracie threw one of her many hats into the political ring and ran for president. Her campaign slogan was, down with common sense, vote for Gracie. But by 1942, their radio program was showing some signs of slowing down. George recognized the problem. The couple were still doing a boyfriend-girlfriend act. George said, everyone knew we were married and had growing children. So George instituted major format changes, added new characters, and from that time on, Burns and Allen portrayed themselves as married. Hello. Are you there? Well, we're here. George Burns and Gracie Allen. Let's hear the new Burns and Allen show. Now we find George and Gracie at breakfast. George, how many lumps do you want in your coffee? Two. Thanks. Is there anything interesting in the paper today, or is it just news? Just news. Yeah. Say, you're lucky to have the paper. Mr. Lassvogel's dog is always chewing it up. I wish that snoopy neighbor would keep his dog away from here. Yesterday morning, he bit little off and Annie in the funny section. <laughs> it wasn't long before George came up with yet another stunt for Gracie. This time, it was the piano concerto for index finger. 
Gracie actually performed the piece all over the country, including Carnegie Hall. George's show business instincts helped to keep the program fresh and Gracie in the public eye. By the end of the 1940s, 45 million listeners tuned in for each show, and the couple were earning almost $10,000 a week. By 1950, it was clear that television was about to explode on the national scene, and many radio stars were making the switch to the upstart medium. It didn't catch George by surprise. In fact, Burns had a meeting with CBS chairman William Paley in 1948 about a television show. Reportedly, it was Paley himself who came up with many of the show's unique elements. But George wasn't sure, and they also had to convince Gracie, who was very nervous about memorizing new lines each week. In 1949, CBS assigned director Ralph Levy to shoot a demo film. The film was shown to Carnation Foods, who immediately agreed to sponsor the show. But Burns was still worried, as he once said, radio is like stealing money. You just stood there with a piece of paper in your hand. With television, Burns and Allen had to be concerned with props, cues, and learning lines. George also insisted on doing a show every other week, giving the team and the writers more time to prepare for each show. Finally, on Thursday night, October 12, 1950, the audience gathered at the Mansfield Theater in New York. At 8 p.m., The Burns and Allen Show, one of radio's most successful programs, made its television debut. And just as Burns and Bill Paley had discussed almost two years earlier, instead of the show opening like a standard situation comedy, George Burns came out alone in front of the audience, introduced himself, and did an opening monologue much like the stage manager in the play, Our Town. Burns introduced Gracie, and the show began. Well, now I'd like you to see where Gracie and I live. That's our uh, home. We live in Beverly Hills. That's the inside of our house. That's the outside right there. That, that hedge, Gracie planted that hedge. In the back, we have a garden. That's my Gracie. That's my razor, too. And that's nothing. I gotta tell you a story about her. She, uh, she was, oh, the Mortons, our neighbors, they live next door. they've done their week's marketing. The role of Blanche Morton was played by B. Benaderet, a veteran radio actress who had also played the role of Blanche on the Burns and Allen radio program. In later years, Benaderet would play the roles of Aunt Pearl on the Beverly Hillbillies, Kate on Petticoat Junction, and the voice of Betty Rubble on the Flintstones. Hal March was the first of four actors who would play the role of Harry Morton on television. He had also played the role on radio. I, uh, I don't have to tell you that they're not newlyweds. Now that you've met Gracie and the Mortons, I'd like to have you meet a fellow that's been with us for a lot of years. And I can safely say that Bill Goodwin is America's most loved announcer. Bill Goodwin was another veteran of the Burns and Allen radio show who also followed the show to television. Well, it's now three hours later. But first, I got to tell you a little story about the Mortons. You see, uh, Harry and his partner, he's in the insurance business, they, uh, oh, there's Gracie at the door. I'll be back in a minute. George, hurry up. The critics raved about the show. The New York Times said, Burns and Allen have made the transition from radio seem effortless. And Variety said, Burns and Allen have clicked with one of the best shows of the year. 
By December of 1950, the Burns and Allen Show had moved to Los Angeles, where the program was done live for the West Coast, and a kinescope was shipped to New York for broadcast two weeks later. A year later, the program was sent to New York live on the new coaxial cable, from which a kinescope was made for broadcast to the West Coast three hours later. On January 4th, 1951, Hal March had returned to New York to appear in another program and later went on to host the $64,000 question. The role of Harry Morton was taken over by British-born actor John Brown. Brown was a veteran radio actor who had appeared in many series. Hey, break it up. They can hear you people a block away. Now come on, get together. Make up and kiss. Kiss him? I wouldn't kiss him with a set of borrowed lips. <laughs> well, borrow some anyway. And why don't about to get the rest of the equipment? Why you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you, you, you can't have everything. So Harry hasn't got much sex appeal. So Blanche isn't as attractive as she used to be. Is that any reason Who to carry on like Harry that? Harry hasn't people, got sex people. appeal. What do you mean, people. Blanche isn't attractive? Well, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. happen to think that Harry's one of the most I wouldn't trade Blanche for any woman in the world. She's, she's, what are you trying to do? I make demand that you apologize to Blanche for the ungentlemanly thing you said about it. You want to start an argument? Don't come around here and do it. Where were we? Um. Oh, yeah. Don't you dare hit me with that hammer! Who's hitting you with the hammer? Happen to have the hammer in my hand when I... Ah, there you go again! I saw you have a bond, Well, oh, go home to your mother! After just ten shows, Brown was gone. There's some mystery as to why John Brown left the program. Reportedly, his name was on one of the infamous blacklists of the period. And later, he was actually called to appear at one of Senator McCarthy's hearings, where he refused to testify. In any event, Burns announced that Brown had left because of, quote, other commitments. In May of 1951, Fred Clark became the third actor to play the role of Harry Morton on television. Oh, hello, Harry. Guess who just got in from San Francisco? And Mamie Kelly in her trailer and the three reasons I shouldn't have come home for lunch. <laughs> well, you look where she parked this trailer right on my new lawn. She'll ruin it. Oh, Harry, don't be childish. It'll ruin the lawn before it'll hurt the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I live here? Why didn't I settle Thank down in... Oh, Larry, don't be funny, little people. Look, Space Captain calling Rocket Patrol. Do you read me? Rocket Patrol speaking. I read you, Space Captain. We sighted Big Space Balloon. What are your orders? Let Big Balloon have it. Roger. And you've got no squawk coming because you've had a very full life with me. Yeah, what's it been full of? <laughs> uh, just a Hi, folks. Oh, hello, Mr. Bontell. Hello, Harry. Hi, Harry. Hey, this is going to be quite a wedding tonight. Mm. <laughs> I saw Gracie outside, and she said the cutest thing. I'll bet she did. I saw all those fellows putting the flowers around on the patio, and I said to Gracie, what are they, delphiniums? She said the tall one might be, but the two I met are Frenchmen. <laughs> to be best man tonight. Well, hold it a minute. In September of 1951, announcer Bill Goodwin left the program, and once again, as he had done with previous cast changes, Burns used his unique way of addressing the audience directly to make the announcement. I'm sorry to stop the show, but I, I got to tell you about Bill Goodwin. Uh, <laughs> Bill Goodwin is going to New York to be starred in his own television show, and we want to wish him every success and happiness. And from now on, Harry Von Zell will be a permanent member of our cast. And I know you're going to like him, because Harry is a fine personality. Okay, on with the show. <laughs> Harry Von Zell would remain with the Burns and Allen show for the rest of its television run. You see that? Carnation has the consistency of cream. It's heavy enough to whip. And there's good, rich cream in every drop. So, what does Carnation do for a large cup of coffee like this? Or a small cup of coffee like this one here? Well, Carnation will do just what you want it to do. Carnation will make any cup of coffee taste a lot better. 
See, Carnation gives coffee a rich, full-bodied flavor, a flavor that has plenty of good, solid satisfaction in it, and certainly that's what you want in coffee. Taste, flavor, goodness, and that's what Carnation gives you. A uh, good many uh, coffee lovers, millions of them, in fact, prefer Carnation in their coffee to cream. And there's one other thing. Carnation, the milk that whips, costs less than half as much as cream. So it pays off. It pays in economy as well as taste to cream your coffee with Carnation. And now here is Carnation's own contented couple, George and Gracie. <laughs> Gracie, let's drink a toast to our sponsor. All right. Uh, not yet. You see, tonight marks the beginning of our second year on television for Carnation. Oh. Uh, not yet, not yet. So, um, to Carnation, may they always be contented. Now, Gracie. Yeah, oh, look, aren't these flowers beautiful? Oh, oh yes, I second. will. Oh, they're lovely. I wonder who they're from. Well, I wonder. Oh, dear. You know, it wasn't I silly a year ago? Yeah, I thought I could get carnation milk by milking carnations. <laughs> Gracie, you, you, you certainly were. Yes, but now when I milk a carnation, I don't expect anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're much smarter this year. Say yeah. good night. Yeah, good night. Good night. In the fall of 1952, Burns announced the program would be filmed. Burns understood that the program could have great future value in reruns. To pay the additional cost of filming, Burns formed McCadden Productions and began filming the shows at the Hollywood Center Studios. The sponsors, Carnation and B.F. Goodrich, paid McCadden a fee of $35,000 per program. Any cost overruns came out of Burns and Allen's pocket. On October 9, 1952, the show not only went to film, but it also became a weekly series. Later in 1952, Burns appeared in a special highlighting the opening of CBS's new television city in Los Angeles. I can't find anything around this building. Do you know where Margaret Whiting is rehearsing? Uh, down in Studio 31, I think. Oh, uh, well, thanks. Uh, well, where's Gracie? Oh, uh, Jack sent her to the state capitol. She's the official escort for Governor Warren. Gracie? Yeah. That takes a lot of courage. Well, if he didn't have courage, he wouldn't be governor. <laughs> Yeah, Margaret, I've got a wonderful idea. Uh, how about you and I doing a duet? A duet? Yeah. Uh, George, who sent you over here? Dinah Shore? Margaret, this is my own idea. Oh, well, listen, there's a lot of singers on this program. Have you tried... Everybody. Oh. <laughs> well, all right. I'll tell you what, let's ask the sportsman to join us and we'll make it a Wait big production. Right. Right. Uh, how about... It might as well be spring. Wonderful. Right. Right. Uh, do you know it? I'll fake it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what uh, what key does Mary Alonzo sing this in? Uh, D flat. One tone higher for All me, right, please. Bye. I'm, 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 I'm as restless as a willow in a windstorm. I'm as restless. I'm as jumpy as a puppet on a string. I'd say that I had. I'm starry eyed and vaguely discontented, discontented, like a nightingale without a song to sing. Oh, why must I have spring fever when it isn't even spring? I keep wishing I, I keep wishing I was somewhere else, walking down a strange new street. I'm as busy as a I'm spider, as busy as a spider <laughs> spinning daydreams. <laughs> I'm as giddy as a baby on a swing. I haven't seen a crocus or a rosebud or a robin on the wing. 
but I feel so good. But I feel so gay in a melancholy way that it might as well be spring. It might as well be... Hey, hey, wait a minute, fellas. George, you can finish this. You won't let me. Well, yes, I will. Would you boys like to finish it? Yes. Yes. Spring. In 1953, Fred Clark was offered a role in the Broadway production of Tea House of the August Moon, and with George and Gracie's good wishes, left the show. Larry Keating, a veteran announcer and actor, took over the role, and George made the following on-air announcement. This is Blanche's fourth husband on the show, so if you single girls want a little tip, get into television. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Larry well, Keating. I'll be back. Harry, wait a minute. This is the fourth time you've been in this morning looking for George. What's going on? Well, as you are aware, the Accountants Club is holding its annual banquet, and I have been selected chairman of the Entertainment Committee. Uh -huh. Well, in a moment of carelessness brought on by conviviality and a few sips of Blackberry Cordial, I agreed to furnish six <laughs> musicians for the evening. Six musicians? Harry, that's going to cost you a lot of money. True, but... I have devised a clever ruse. I will invite George to sing at the banquet. Now, he will be so delighted at this rare opportunity, I feel sure he will offer to pay for the musicians himself. Oh, hell, that's a pretty <laughs> sneaky trick. And what makes you think he'll fall for it? Well, you know how George feels about his singing. Yeah, something the way Bridget Bardot feels about her towel. <laughs> In 1954, Fred de Cordova became the producer-director of the Burns and Allen Show and stayed with the program until 1956. It was about this time that CBS was feeling pressure from NBC, which had started to air some of its shows in color. So CBS paid for one episode of the Burns and Allen Show to be filmed in color. And it was broadcast on October 4th, 1954. Burns's McCadden Productions was becoming busy. Along with filming commercials for their own show and others, Burns became the co-producer of The Bob Cummings Show, which began a five-year hit run in 1955 and was later called Love That Bob in syndication. George's best friend Jack Benny's program was still being broadcast live on CBS, but Benny filmed six shows at the McCadden Studios. One classic episode is Jack scheming to get his pals George Burns and Bing Crosby to appear on his show, the ever penny-pinching Benny appeals to their good old days in vaudeville when they had an act called Goldie, Fields, and Glide. Actually, Goldie, Fields, and Glide was a real act that Burns was part of. So first we'll listen to George talk about the real act from a 1960 special. And then we'll look back at the classic 1954 Jack Benny Show version. My name was Jimmy Glide. I did an, an act then called Goldie, Fields, and Glide. Goldie's right name was Jaime Goldberg. I found him in the laundry. Used to sing while he'd iron shirts. Sang a little bit like Anna Marie Albighetti. But the trouble was he couldn't sing without ironing. So on the stage when he'd sing, his motions would go something like this. From time to time in every climb, blessings come from above all. And then he turned the iron when he got to his sleeve. <laughs> well, we were not a very we were, we, we were not a very attractive trio. Goldie would sing like he was ironing, and I'd sing like I'm still holding the pictures under my arm. <laughs> anyway, we were booked for three days, you guessed it, the Myrtle Theater in Brooklyn. Monday morning, we were rehearsing our act. I was in the middle of, um, oh, heart of my heart, I love you, when the manager walked down the stage, and he said, day glide. <laughs> Aren't you the Willie Sachs? He said, if you notice on the program that mentions all the acts, you take a look at number two, see the name of Sachs. He used to be Joe Healy, who said, love is like the mumps, the only hour when you get it, the harder it goes, and you first fall in love, you're full of blood, like cats, full of pregnant. <laughs> I never answered him. I just wiped the makeup off my collar, stuck my pictures under my arm and left. <laughs> Goldie went back to the laundry, Fields went into the insurance business, and I turned out to be Williams, a brown Williams singers, dancers, and roller skaters. Don't sigh when the silver moon and shine. 
way up in the big blue sky. Then you know my heart and I'm hiding for you, dear, don't cry. <laughs> my heart will find for you when the toil of day is through. Every little star gleaming from afar will be shining just for you, my little honey. The toil of day is through. We'll be roaming in the gloaming, in the gloaming, we'll be roaming. Oh, honey, I will find for you. Bum, 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 bum. In October of 1955, Burns' McCadden production scored another hit with The People's Choice. According to a story in Look Magazine, when the producer was pitching George the show, he explained, this fellow comes out of the woods and it's Jackie Cooper. He's followed by a dog who says, George jumps in, the dog says? The producer said, yes, the dog. George turned to his associate and said, give him the money. If they walk into that park and see a whole statue of me, I'll be a dead pigeon. <laughs> Covered by live pigeons. As far as the Burns and Allen show, George felt it was time to freshen it up a bit. So in 1955, he made two format changes. First, he changed the locale from California to New York. And the first episode of the 1955 season has the entire cast traveling to New York on the train. The second change was adding a son, and the audience was introduced to a fully grown 20-year-old Ronnie Burns, which was, of course, Burns and Allen's real adopted son, Ronnie. Once again, Burns' show business instincts proved on target, and Ronnie quickly became a teenage heartthrob, complete with a recording contract and his own fan club. Another Burns innovation was his magic television set, which allowed him to watch his own show in progress and make comments about the plot to the audience. George called it his 21-inch keyhole. If George wasn't busy enough as the star of his own show and head of a successful production company, he took time out to narrate the 1956 film, The Solid Gold Cadillac. In 1958, Gracie announced she was going to retire. Friends, the press, and the public pleaded with her to reconsider, but she was tired and her health was suffering from the hectic schedule. The final original episode, number 299 of the Burns and Allen Show, aired on September 15, 1958. Burns and Allen had been on America's airwaves continuously for more than 25 years. For the first time since 1932, America would no longer be treated to new installments of the team's memorable comedy banter like these classic moments. Well, what'd you do today? Well, I went to the beauty shop, and I met Clara Bagley, and she was going to the doctor's, so I went along with her. Well, that was very nice of you. But the minute I got in the doctor's office, I knew he was no good. You knew he was a bad doctor? Yeah, all his patients were sick. <laughs> <laughs> You're very observing. Yeah, oh, here's a good one. Have you got a pencil? There's a pencil on the back table. All right. He had a beautiful blonde nurse, and even she was sick. She was sick, yeah, too? Yeah, she kept begging him to take out her appendix. The nurse wanted her appendix taken out? Yeah, every time she went into his private office, I could hear her saying, Now, doctor, please cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe me, I'm glad my sister Hazel is only two-thirds married. Hazel is only two-thirds married? Well, sure, only she and the minister showed up. <laughs> Oh, yes, I remember the groom couldn't get away from his wife. I remember? Oh, yes, vividly, vividly, yes. Oh, men. Look, Gracie, uh, I know that you're all worked up, but I wouldn't let this get out of the house, because if it does, you're going to be laughed at. Yeah, let them laugh. They laugh at all intelligent women. They even laughed at Joan of Arc, but she went right ahead and built it. <laughs> built, built what? The Ark. The ark was built by a man. <laughs> the person who built the ark was a woman. Noah. How could I know? She's been dead for years. <laughs> uh oh, 
someone at the door. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, George. It must be Mr. Douglas, the principal of our neighborhood school. I phoned him to come over. Come in. The, the, the principal? Yes, I want to see if his school is good enough for Mamie's children. Oh, I see. Hey. Oh, hi, Burnses. Oh, oh hello, hi. Hi. Oh, I thought you were Mr. Douglas. Oh, no. <laughs> well, we do look a lot alike, Gracie, but I'm darker than Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas? George, did you hear that? I didn't know that he was the principal of a neighborhood school. <laughs> I came over and tell Blanche maybe we can go to night school. <laughs> Come on, honey, you get busy and finish autographing those carnation cookbooks. I can finish getting dinner alone. Can you really? Of course uh, I can. Hello, Blanche. Oh, hi, George. Where's Harry? Well, he was lying down, but he'll be over as soon as he shaves and puts on his shoes. Oh. Blanche, why does he shave his feet? <laughs> He started when he was very young. Yeah. He uh, wasn't tall enough to reach his face. Oh. oh, say, George, you should have been with me this afternoon. Oh? After we finished uh, shopping, I went to the zoo. Did you have fun? Oh, yes, you know, Professor Bradford said we should eat like animals. Oh, and you went there to see how the animals eat, huh? Yes, yeah, and I got a few good ideas. Of course, we could never afford to eat $10 bills like the elephants do. In fact, I don't yeah, think they... The, uh, the elephants eat $10 bills? Oh, sure, there was a sign that said, uh, Do not feed elephants peanuts. $10, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a little shove like that. You did not. You pushed me hard like that. I gave you a little shove like that. Harry, hard like that. Soft like that. Harry Morton, like that. <laughs> Once upon a time, on a beautiful Christmas morning, Scrooge and Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim went for a walk in the woods while their breakfast was cooling. <laughs> so, uh, this little girl uh, saw the breakfast cooling and she decided to taste it. So she tried the first bowl and it was too hot, and she tried the second bowl and it was too cold, and she tried the third bowl and it was just right, and she ate it all up. That was Goldilocks. Uh, no, it was porridge. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sam Porridge, a tall fellow I played in Baltimore with him. Well, anyway, this poor little girl had two rich stepsisters. And then along came Prince Charming with a glass slipper. So he tried it on the first stepsister, and it was too hot. And he tried it on the second stepsister. It was too cold, and he tried down the, the, the poor little girl, and it just fit. And she married him, and guess who got all the money? Walt Disney. <laughs> well, Gracie and I will be back again in two weeks. And uh, I was just told that we're about uh, 40 or 50 seconds short, and I'd love to do some little thing, but we're not prepared. I am. Uh, you see, uh, I can tell it's, you about it's, Mr. Paley. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, very, it's, Mr. Paley it's very hard to time, to time these shows. I to can't time these shows unless you know how long you've got to do it. Uh, you, you might but not. Mr. Paley you, came to my you, dressing room with two glasses you, you of champagne just a little while ago. Did you know that, George, about Mr. Paley coming to my dressing room? Came back just a little while ago with two glasses of champagne. Two glasses of champagne. Two glasses of champagne. Yes, he did. Mr. Paley. Yes. Two glasses. Yes, and he said to me, he said, well, Gracie, here's to your health. Let's drink bottoms up. Well? Well, isn't that kind of an awkward position? <laughs> It's almost impossible to imagine anyone else replacing Gracie, but one person who actually tried it was Jack Benny. Burns and Benny often performed a hilarious takeoff at charity affairs, and this performance from a 1954 Jack Benny television show. Oh, 
Gracie, say hello. Hello. <laughs> Hair looks very pretty tonight. I know. You know. I had it done at the beauty parlor. Oh. And George, I heard the most wonderful joke over there. You want to hear it? No, yeah, we'd all love to hear it. Had everybody dying laughing. Well, let's, let's hear it. Well, one fella said to the other fella, if you don't think so, brother, you ought to see my wife. <laughs> is, uh, is this the whole joke? Oh, no, there was a lot of stuff ahead of it that I didn't hear, you see, but this is the line that had everybody dying laughing. <laughs> uh, Gracie, I, I, I don't think you ought to tell that. Too risque. Too naughty. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's talk about your brother. All right, which one should we talk about? The one who's married or the one who's in love? The one who's in love. Willie, the tall one. The one that has the scar on the chin. Oh, the, uh, the appendicitis scar. <laughs> now, appendicitis is on the stomach, you see, if... if yeah, I know, but Willie was ticklish down there, so they had to operate. Uh, <laughs> uh, how is Willie? Willie? Mm. Oh, Willie broke his back, you know. Oh, broke his back? Mm-hmm. On account of he's left-handed. <laughs> broke his back because he's left-handed? Mm-hmm. You see, he had a donut in his right-hand pocket, and when he tried to take it out with his left hand... Broke he... his back. Yeah. <laughs> well, the next time he's got a donut in his right-hand pocket, tell him to try to take it out with his right hand. Well, that's hard to do when you got your pants on backwards. <laughs> his pants on backwards? Mm-hmm. You see, he, he was wearing two pair of pants. He had one on frontwards and one on backwards. So that he could go either way. Yeah. <laughs> That's when the truck hit him. The, uh, the truck? Mm -hmm. What truck? The truck that didn't have its lights lit. Well, why didn't the truck have its lights lit? Because he had his pants hold on. Hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> the man in the truck have his pants on backwards, or did Willie have his pants on backwards? Oh, George, you're trying to confuse I'm me. I'm confusing you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Willie had his pants but on backwards. But the man in the truck, why didn't he have his lights lit? Hmm? <laughs> the man in the truck, why didn't he have his lights lit? Because he didn't have to. It was in the daytime. <laughs> well... If it was in the daytime, didn't he see your brother coming? Oh, he didn't know it was my brother. <laughs> he didn't? No. <laughs> see, he just saw two pair of pants coming towards him, so he drove the right... Up. Yeah. In 1958, George Burns was 62 years old. He told Variety, I'm too old to retire. So keeping everyone from the cast of the Burns and Allen Show, minus Gracie, the George Burns Show premiered on NBC in October of 1958. Gee, Dad, that Mr. Jessup is tough. He's seen 12 acts and only picked two. Judy and I'll never make it. Now just relax and don't be nervous. I'm not nervous, Mr. Burns. It doesn't make a diff of bitterance to me whether he likes us or not. A diff of bitterance? A bit of difference. I'm so nervous. She's, the way she said it the first time sounded right. Look, look, there's nothing to be nervous about. You just go out on the stage and you, you do the act. I, it took me months to put it together for you. Now, you know your routine, don't you? Yeah, Start we start with a dance. Song. A dance. Song? You open with the jokes I gave. They're great jokes. I've done them for years. Then you do your song and then you do your dance. Ronnie, it's ridiculous for us to be this nervous. Yeah, well, I'll just count to ten. Relax. One, two, three. What comes after that? Well, you'll be fine when you get out on the stage, and when this show goes to Broadway, you'll go with it. Thank you very much. Next. Well, Judy, say hello to the audience. Hello. You know, I had to wait. You were late. Oh, Ronnie, I'm sorry. I was at the doctor's office. Oh, and while I was sitting in the waiting room, I heard the funniest joke. Would you like to hear it? Well, sure. I think everybody would. Well, this one man said to the other man, and wait until you see my wife. That's the whole joke? Oh, no, there was some stuff ahead of it that I didn't hear, but that was the line that made everybody laugh. Thank you, kids. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I can't use you. It's not exactly what I need for my review. Thank you, sir. You heard the man. I thought you were fine. Oh, Dad, we were... But the show just wasn't the same without Gracie. 
and even after format changes, NBC dropped the program in April of 1959. George had been around too long to let anything get him down for long, and soon he was back on the air joking around with his pals Jack Benny, Eddie Cantor, and Georgie Jessel when they all appeared in a 1959 special. How do you like that guy? We come on a show to do him a favor, he's doing the whole thing himself. Take the cigar away from Burns, or what do you got? A very old Bobby Darren. <laughs> You're right. You know, he repeats everything you say, just like every other straight man. Now, the other day I saw him on the street, and I said to him, George, how's your brother Willie? So he says to me, how's my brother Willie? Then I had to think of a funny answer. <laughs> Boy, how does the show look? George, you were just great. You were, you were magnificent. I could hear you sing forever. You don't need anybody. Yeah. Well, I knew you'd love it. Look, fellas, I'm going out to introduce the pals number. Yeah. Now, when we sing together, it's my show. So please, don't sing too loud. <laughs> How do you like that? Don't sing too loud. How do you like that? Pals, pals, we'll always be pals. What you do is okay. girl of today is a problem this world has to face. They blame it on this and they blame it on that, but they don't seem to get any place. Ah, it isn't the lipstick, the cocktails, the I, jazz, uh, the corner. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a mother who says if you're not I'm holding hands, then you don't have to be so free. Then you go to a nice jazz. And each one of them is a George decided it was time to go back on the stage, so with the help of his writers, they put together a nightclub act, which he began to perform in Lake Tahoe in Las Vegas. Along with his own routine, he would work with various female partners, including Carol Channing and his discovery, Anne Margaret. Another performer who appeared with George during this time was Bobby Darren. Here's Burns and Darren from a 1960 TV special. Thank you. Bobby, you're a delight. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. A lot has happened to you in the last year. Yes, sir. How does it feel to be 24 years old and to be one of the top recording stars? You know, you know, the same thing could have happened to me, but when I was 24, Edison was 24, and he hadn't invented the phonograph yet. <laughs> uh, actually, I was really lucky, Mr. Burns. Sure was, because, after all, I owe most of my success to just one man. Bobby, you, do? you don't have to say that. Yes, I do, sir. <laughs> Because, because after all, where would I be without the guy that wrote Mac the Knife? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's uh, that's who I was thinking of too. Uh, although Bobby, I did have a little to do with your success. I didn't write Mac the Knife, but I wrote Elvis Presley's draft board and got Elvis in the army. That didn't hurt you either. Oh no, it sure didn't. <laughs> sure didn't hurt at all. No. Say, Mr. Burns. Yeah. W would you do me a favor, sir? Would you write another letter for Fabian? <laughs> Look, Bobby, how about singing a little song together? Gee, Mr. Burns, I'd love to. I really would. But, you know, the last time we did the show, both of us sang a song together, and yeah. there might be a sameness, you know? I just might. Why don't, uh, say, I have an idea. Why don't you sing a song with, with Betty Grable? Betty Grable, sure. huh? Sure. Yeah, yeah, that might be an idea. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, after all, you've, you've uh, helped me enough. Why don't you do it to somebody else? I mean, why don't you do it... Why don't you do it for somebody else, is what I meant. No. Uh, Betty Grable, yeah. She, she, she's a beautiful girl, and we could do a boy and girl number. Certainly. And, and, and I could give her every fight line. <laughs> I know that this is going to break your heart, but I've decided not to sing with you. Well, I guess you just have to take the good with the bad. By now, George's desire to sing had become a running gag. As we've seen earlier, he failed in his attempt to sing with Margaret Whiting and Bobby Darren. Later in the 1960s show, he tried again, this time with Polly Bergen and Betty Grable. Now, which will it be? I'd love to, George, but I've got laryngitis. <laughs> she caught it first. 
from me. <laughs> I'm cooked. All right. Will you dance with me? <laughs> what did you say, George? <laughs> she caught it from you, yeah. <laughs> Do you girls happen to have a relative in gun smoke named Chester? <laughs> All right, no singing, no dancing. How about taking a little walk with me? A walk? A walk? Sure. sure. Wait a minute, George. Later in the show, Jack Benny defends George's right to sing. Well, well, sort of. George has had that voice down in him all these years. A lot of years. And it's improving with age. <laughs> right now, his voice is like... like a rare old wine. Like a fine old cheese. <laughs> George Burns has got as much as any of the big singers of today. I don't care who you mention. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Perry Como. Arthur Rubenstein. He's a piano. <laughs> what do I know about singers? <laughs> George, Jack, Jack, I know what you're trying to do, and believe me, you're doing it. <laughs> Please. I want you to remember that George has been a star in show business for 30 years. 32. 37 years. 37 years. And you may ask me why. Ask me why. Ask me how. But, but that show business. <laughs> Although Gracie was enjoying retirement, she did make a few appearances like this one, where the Friars Club honored Burns and Allen. On the other hand, George was keeping very busy performing and producing television shows. In 1961, McCadden Productions helped develop the hit show, Mr. Ed, which ran in first run from 1961 to 1966. During the early 60s, Burns continued to successfully perform in nightclubs and theaters, but he had television on his mind. Burns began working on a new show idea as a tune-up for his return to regularly scheduled television. In 1964, he hosted ABC's Hollywood Palace. Augustus J. McCann was a hand-packed married man. He has been fighting with his wife since married life began. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's one of my big hits. That was especially arranged for me by John Philip Sousa's father. <laughs> I introduced that song in Altoona, and it swept the whole town. But the trouble was, I was in the middle of the first chorus, and they swept me out with it. <laughs> one night, it had, you know I love to sing. I wake Gracie up in the middle of the night two or three times a week. I sing her a song, and we go back to sleep again. <laughs> We've been happily married for 38 years. If Betty Fish had done that, he still would have been married. Part of George's hosting duties was to introduce next week's hosts. Assisting him is a very young Raquel Welch. Howdy. Dad. So nice to see you. And Raquel, you better go to my dressing room and get some aspirin. You're going to catch cold. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Goodbye, Raquel. Wish my son Ronnie was here. <laughs> In the summer of 1964, Burns was busy preparing his new show, Wendy and Me, for a fall start on ABC. In addition, his company, McCadden, was producing another show, No Time for Sergeants, which was also slated for the 1964 through 1965 season. And ABC was making sure to get the word out. Howdy. I'm Sammy Jackson. I know, you're the star of No Time for Sergeants. But this other fellow looks familiar. Who is he? I'm Patty Duke. You don't look like him. <laughs> Mr. Burns, that's Ben Crosby. Thank you. His show comes on right after yours on Monday night. Thanks, kid. Hello, Ben. Hello, George. A delightful comedy called Wendy and Me. Is that your show, George? That's right, Ben. Connie Stevens plays Wendy and Me is Me. And uh, what are you calling your show? Uh, the Ben Crosby Show. Will he let you use that name? Oh, yeah. We grew up together. No time for sergeants, Wendy and Me, and the Bing Crosby Show. Every Monday night on ABC. On August 27, 1964, while at home, Gracie began to suffer chest pains. 
Although she had suffered a previous heart attack a few years earlier, she had fully recovered. George rushed her to the hospital, but she died later that evening. Gracie Allen was 58 years old. The funeral was held on the following Monday. The outpouring of love and affection from fans and fellow performers was overwhelming. Many stars attended, including Edward G. Robinson, Milton Berle, Bobby Darren and Sandra Dee, Bob Hope and Danny Kaye, Nancy and Ronald Reagan, V. Benaderet, and of course, Jack Benny. At the eulogy, Georgie Jessel said, the act is over, the bomb music's faded, the billing will have to be changed to George Burns alone. So be it. But the hope of mankind is that the play is never over. When the curtain falls, it rises again. Ironically, Wendy and Me premiered less than one month after Gracie's death. Wendy, you're not going to tell me about the birds and the bees. Oh, no, there's been enough gossip about them already. But the program was in trouble from the start. ABC had scheduled it against the Andy Williams Show and the Lucy Show. But George did everything he could to promote the program and his co-star, Connie Stevens, including this 1965 appearance on the Hollywood Palace. Connie, you're absolutely darling. Oh, thanks, George. You know, but there's one thing that's been puzzling me, and I'm going to ask you about it. Oh? Uh, Why did you pick me to play Wendy? You know, that part is silly. I mean, I'm a pretty good dramatic actress, you know. Well, I picture the night we were in the restaurant together. Remember, we were there with some people. Oh, you mean the night the waiter said, do you want any shrimps? And I said, no, I'd rather go out with telefellows? <laughs> That's the night I knew you were a great dramatic actress. <laughs> Let's do something together. Okay. Uh, Mitch and Mr. Burns, keep leave. My kid brother, he... No, that's the other song. Uh, what is the song? Listen, listen, listen. Oh, yeah, listen. Listen, listen. Listen to the Reagan. I got so many numbers. Listen. Listen to the Reagan music playing. It's reminiscent. Listen what you miss on that tune. It keeps you swaying. My, but that music sounds so sweet. I just can't keep still on my feet. Because ragtime music to me is a perfect treat because it can't be beat. At the ball, when you're feeling kind of blue... Something strange and wonderful was happening to Burns. After all those years of encouraging Gracie to take center stage, people were now looking at Burns in a new light, and they loved what they saw. Confirmation of his newfound personal appeal came when comedians like Rich Little began doing George Burns impressions. Those were great impressions. Thank you. But you left out one of the great personalities in show business. I did? Yeah, yes, you did. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> you know, it really is a tremendous thrill. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, that's Jack Benny. I'm, I'm thinking of a singer. A singer? A fellow that oh, sings. Oh, yeah. well, this, this is Bing Crosby, you know. It's a great joy, you know, and a great no, thrill no, to be no, on the, uh, no. the Hollywood Palace show. Uh, this, uh, 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 this is a fellow that sings a tone higher than Bing and smokes a cigar. I don't know that Groucho smokes. No. <laughs> me, me, uh, do me. Oh, well, let me ask you this question. <laughs> how's, uh, how's, how's your brother? Uh, which one do you mean, George? The, uh, the, uh, the one with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the appendicitis scar up, up there in the No, snack. appendicitis is on the stomach. I know, see, but, but he was so ticklish that had to operate, operate up there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Although Wendy and Me was dropped after one season, Burns took it philosophically. After all, it wasn't the first time George had been canceled. I was, uh, I was playing in a theater in, in, um, in Schenectady, and after my first song, I was canceled, and I didn't have fare to go back to New York. And there was a guy on the bill, he used to shoot, shoot another fellow out of a cannon. And he helped me, he shot me as far as Newark. <laughs> but I, hitch, I had to hitchhike the rest of the way. There was, there, it was very hard to pick up another cannon that time of the night. <laughs> After Wendy and Me, Burns returned to performing live on stage, and he never missed the opportunity to get in a few jokes about his best friend, Jack Benny. 
And Jack Benny's gimmick is being stingy. And that's not true. When I played Las Vegas, Jack Benny came on to see me. And the minute he saw the crap table, he ran over to the table and he grabbed the dice. In fact, they were still talking about it the next day. Do you know that he held the dice for one hour and 45 minutes? Finally, he threw them and rolled a crap. <laughs> Lost a dollar and somebody had to hold him for an hour and 45 minutes. And now here's the only man that Jack Benny ever takes out to dinner. That's because he makes him laugh. George Burns! In 1966, Burns appeared on the Hollywood Palace, hosted by Bing Crosby. The two had first appeared on the screen together more than 30 years earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me while I put this holder on my cigar. At my age, that's exciting. <laughs> 16 beautiful chorus girls on the bill, and I'm dressing next door to Crosby. <laughs> but the funny thing is, Crosby thought he was dressing next door to the chorus girls, and I thought I was dressing next door to them. And there's a little hole in the wall between our two dressing rooms. <laughs> Naturally, I took a little peek through the hole, and there was Crosby peeking back at me. <laughs> I think he's got bad eyes. He whistled at me twice. <laughs> See, the bad eyes are very bad judgment. <laughs> Gotta light this cigar. I can't, I can't talk unless I smoke. Seeing me without a cigar is like seeing Mrs. Miller on the middle page of Playboy. <laughs> and at my age, that's exciting. <laughs> Just a minute now. Hold it. Hold it here, sugar throat. I want to tell you, bring up a point with you. I notice there's a little hole in the wall between our two dressing rooms. Well, use it. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Bing, I'll tell you what. Let's sing a little song together, and I promise to plug up the hole. Oh, no, no, no. Don't plug up the hole. No, I'm copying the design on those pink striped shorts of yours. <laughs> At my age, that's very exciting. Mitch or Mikey? How can it miss? How can it wait, miss? Wait, you, you did one like that. How can it miss? How, you did it before. Well, look, this verse fits any chorus. Oh, it's Take a out any song. Verse, and good. Bing, here's a tempo. Play with it. Let's hear it. When the chorus goes like this. Oh, you're nobody. You're nobody. Till somebody. Till somebody. Loves you. Loves someone who loves you every minute. You're nobody. You're nobody. Till somebody can. Yes, look around and find some loving gal. <laughs> you may be king. Yeah. You may possess. You may possess. The world. It's not. And it's the gold. money that's important. But gold won't bring you. No, it won't. So when all you want to go do what you want to do, I don't care. Oh, the world. Oh, the world. Still going to be the same. It's the same. You never change You it. can't afford to be all alone on the shelf. Just as sure. As sure. As the stars. As the stars. Shine above. Don't want to be feeling sad and lonely. You're nobody. You're nobody. Till somebody. Somebody. Really love you. Yes, find yourself a loving baby. So find so yourself and somebody and to, to love, love, to love, love, to love, 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 love. <laughs> and now, from the Hollywood Palace, here is your host, the man who makes all America laugh, especially Jack Benny, George Burns. In 1967, Burns, who was now over 70 years old, was still delighting audiences with his show business stories and his never-ending attempts to sing duets with other performers. You know, people are always asking me why I, I use a cigar on the stage. For the same reason that Perry Como sits on a stool and Jackie Gleason works with a cup of coffee. The reason for the props is that actors get nervous in front of an audience. But if it's a good audience, you don't need these things. And from past experience, I could look at an audience and tell immediately whether it's going to be a good or a bad audience. <laughs> I wonder he has to sit down to drink this stuff. <laughs> Mitch or Mikey? 
All little Johnny Warner was sitting in the corner of a swell cafe eating his heart away because he had no girl hold it. Hold it. I must tell you something. We've got a very, very exciting show tonight. Got some great novelty acts, and we've got the King family, Enzo Stawati, Lainey Kazan, and they all sing great. But the reason that they're all on the show, the producers figured with all these wonderful voices, there wouldn't be room for mine. <laughs> but I'm the host. I'll make room. <laughs> At another table sat a girl named Mabel with a fellow who Johnny knew in his head began to whirl. Wait, wait, wait. You know, the producers keep giving me that stuff. They say, George, you're supposed to be a comedian. Well, I got news for them. I'd rather sing than be a hit. <laughs> and we got into a big argument. They wanted me to do comedy, and I wanted to sing, so we, we, we compromised. Tonight, I'm going to sing some of my jokes. <laughs> you know, the difference between me and these other singers on the show is that they need you. When they exit, they need your applause to bring them back. But not me. I'm coming back anyway. In the early 1970s, Burns was a frequent guest on many television programs, including Here Comes the Stars, a celebrity roast show hosted by his old friend, Georgie Jessel. Eddie, that seems to be a fine cigar. It has a wonderful aroma. It ought to be. It's very expensive. Is that so? Mm. Tell me, is that cigar you're smoking expensive? I hope so. I found it. <laughs> Uh, Eddie, what do you pay for your cigars? Two dollars. Two dollars a piece? Mm-hmm. I paid two dollars for a cigar. First, I dance with it. <laughs> In 1975, Burns received a special award from Princess Margaret for his contribution to a royal charity show. Burns was almost 80 years old, and once again, his life was about to take another surprising turn. Jack Benny had been cast to star in the film version of The Sunshine Boys, but he passed away shortly before filming was to begin. Burns was asked to step in for his best friend and play opposite Walter Matthau. The film was inspired by the comedy team of Smith and Dale. Here's Burns getting some tips from the real Joe Smith. It was perfect casting. After all, George had also been a member of a legendary comedy team. Walter Matthau, George Burns, are making a movie about a vaudeville team who have been the funniest men in America for 43 years and have hated every minute of it. I haven't seen him in 11 years. I haven't spoken to him in 12 years. Can't stand him, but I don't hate him. On the set of The Sunshine Boys, George Burns was asked who he felt were the funniest men of all time. Walter Matthau and myself. Burns had done it again. He received rave reviews and the 1975 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Burns said, if you stay in the business long enough and get old enough, you get to be new all over again. George Burns, an old friend, and Walter Matt, our new friend. Ladies and gentlemen, again, excellence in art. Here they are, the Sunshine Boys. If I were you, I'd start thinking about using a cigar holder like I'm using. It, 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 you don't need it now, but when you get to be my age, when you put a cigar into a holder, it's exciting. <laughs> CBS celebrated Burns' Oscar with a television special in 1976. Playing a vaudeville comedian was natural for Burns. But what could prepare him for his next film role in the 1977 release, Oh God? Well, nothing but 80 years of living and his own unique personality. Time magazine raved, Burns impeccable and legendary timing is essential to working miracles as it is to telling jokes. Burns maintains a dignity that must surely be appreciated in heaven. Later that year, Burns was back on CBS hosting the People's Command performance. In 1978, Burns returned to the screen in two films, Movie Movie and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, where the octogenarian entertainer kept pace with rock stars Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Burns always seemed to have the knack of pairing himself with younger performers. Here's George and a very young Wayne Newton from 1965. Wayne, you're absolutely marvelous. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. Thank you. Ask Gab, how old are you? I'm 22. How many records have you sold? Three million. <laughs> We're both in the same league. I'm three million years old and sold 22 records. 
Let me ask you something. Where did you, where did you get this singing style? Well, I have a confession to make, Mr. Burns. I must admit that I've learned an awful lot from watching the real old timers. <laughs> You're dead, huh? Yes, sir. Paul Anka, Frankie Avalon. <laughs> sing with you, but unfortunately I can't. Why not? Your manager asked me not to. <laughs> In a business preoccupied with youth, Burns' age was just the opposite, and CBS even pushed it when George hosted his own 100th birthday party special, albeit premature. In 1979, George was back on the screen and just you and me, kid, with Brooke Shields and the critically acclaimed Going in Style. In the film, George plays the ringleader of a gang of senior citizens, played by Art Carney and Lee Strasberg. The trio decide to rob a bank to relieve their boredom and get more than they bargained for. The 1980s had George busier than ever, with two sequels to Oh God, Oh God, Book Two, and Oh God, You Devil. On television, there were cable and network specials, and in 1985, less than a year shy of his 90th birthday, Burns became the oldest person to host his own TV series, George Burns Comedy Week, a short-lived comedy anthology series for CBS. How busy was George? Well, incredibly. In 1985, People magazine voted Burns one of the busiest people in the world, and the awards were also pouring in, including the Kennedy Center and the Association of Variety Artists. In 1988, Burns celebrated his 92nd birthday by playing an 81-year-old swinging bachelor in the film 18 Again. And what a milestone it is. Lots of cherished friends of Mr. Burns turned out tonight to lend their best wishes. I, I wish him what uh, God has given him so far, and uh, may it ever continue. I, we were at his 80th, we were at, now, we were at his 90th, now this 92, and... It's not far from 100. I'm sure he'll be here. I think it's marvelous. I think it's great. I think he's a man who deserves it. <laughs> George was not only celebrating his 92nd, but also promoting a new film, 18 Again, which co-stars Charlie Schlatter. What are you going to wish for this birthday? What do I wish for? <laughs> Another martini. <laughs> To cap off 1988, George wrote the best-selling book, Gracie, A Love Story, and would later go on to write numerous books. In 1989, Burns and Allen were inducted into the Television Hall of Fame, and it seemed fitting that along with TV pioneers Red Skelton, David Suskind, Huntley and Brinkley, and David Walper, George's dearest friend Jack Benny would also be inducted. The Burns and Benny friendship has given all of us such wonderful memories. I really think you're the greatest. Well, if you, if you really feel that way, I just happen to have my violin here. I don't, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah well, 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 I just happen to have my piano here. Really? There it comes. <laughs> George, you mean you're going to sing while I play? Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. You're gonna play while I sing? It seemed with each new birthday, more and more people wanted to celebrate with George. And in 1991, Hollywood threw a star-studded birthday bash for the 95-year-old Burns. She said no, he said yes. She said yes, he said no. A year later, while celebrating his 96th birthday, he was asked what it was like being a legend. But you don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm George Burns, the legend. No, I get up when I get up, I say, the legend is getting up. <laughs> God is getting up. <laughs> Only when I get paid. To be my age, to be 95 and get out of bed and have something to do and, and love what you're doing is terribly important. I stand up and I sit down and I dance a little bit. 
I don't kick the back of my head. And I don't do splits anymore, you know. But. In March of 1992, Burns took to the spotlight in a gala honoring him for his many charitable contributions. And once again, the stars showed up to pay tribute. Well, because it's important to be alive at my age, to do everything, anything. Glad to be here. I'm smoking a cigar. In 1993, Burns, now 97 years old, was still packing him into nightclubs and theaters all over. On November 11th, Caesars Palace announced they were signing Burns to a lifetime contract and talked about plans for celebrating his first 100 years of performing. Comedian Arsenio Hall was also there to honor Burns. slowing down. A week later, Burns was in Palm Beach for another sold-out show. Earlier in the day, he talked with the press. What was it like making the transition from radio to television? It was easier for me, you know, but I, I, Gracie was with me. Gracie had, uh, if there was, I talked to Sometimes I tell her, oh, she doesn't laugh anymore, she doesn't want to show. Where's she buried? What? Where is Gracie buried? With her father's mom. She got out of the country. She got a vehicle. Well, I don't know. Down the ball was right there. So you really stopped by every month? Uh -huh. Really? Yeah. Uh, so you really stopped by every month? Oh, yeah. I thought I'd be one. Yeah. I didn't make you feel good. It seemed George Burns was indestructible. He once said, retire? Never. I'm making old age fashionable. That's why it was such a shock when in October of 1994, Burns had to be rushed to the hospital to have a dangerous buildup of fluid drained from his brain. His longtime friend and manager, Irving Fine, held a news conference. But they decided they'd better do this. So they went ahead and Monday night they operated. It was a small, short operation. And uh, he came through it fairly well. But the entertainer isn't out of the woods yet. He's in intensive care now, and he's improving every day. The doctor, I spoke to both Dr. Cooper and Dr. Sugarman a few minutes ago, and they both think he'll be out of intensive care tomorrow and be in the hospital for five or six or seven days. George Burns still performs despite his age, and he's even performing in intensive care. And he's had three or four nurses, and he's doing his act and singing some of the songs that, um, that, um, that he does in his act. And they, they were all laughing, and he was having a good time. But any man who could play God three times can't be counted out. And remarkably, three months later, there was the 99-year-old George Burns being honored just outside the very same hospital he had been recently rushed to. So what's George Burns' secret? Well, he said it this way. I love show business, and I'm lucky to have spent my whole life in it. I would rather be a failure at something I love than a success at something I hated to do. A failure indeed. Here's what President Ronald Reagan once said about George. I just couldn't turn down this opportunity to say a few words about George Burns. This bionic geriatric, this Sun City Fonzie, the only man I know who does fool Mother Nature. And now the days are short. I'm in the autumn of the year And I think of my life as vintage wine From fine old kegs, from the brim to the dregs It poured sweet and clear It was a very good year
very much. And, and, and don't forget to send for one of these new cookbooks. Uh, Gracie, yeah, Gracie, what? why are you whispering? Well, I autographed so many books that my arm fell asleep and I don't want to wake it up. <laughs> Say goodnight. 